I think everyone here has. So you kind of know what I'm going to be saying as far as the differences of watercolor and oil and the similarities to um, the colors. So, and a lot of people have come up to me and said, why don't you do oil? Why don't you do acrylic? And a long time ago, I painted only in oil. And I did big abstract paintings and uh, acrylic paintings. But I don't know, I just became fascinated with the properties of water and watercolor. And I think that what I'm going to tell you, you know, but it might be a good review. Water has unique properties. It's fluid, it has water tension, uh, at the top the molecules tighten up so that it doesn't move unless you let gravity help it out. So you have to kind of keep all of this in mind. <clears throat> and then when you add pigment to watercolor, it changes. Some pigments sink, and some pigments float, and some are both. So if you really want to get into watercolor, you have to know your paints. And the only way to do that is to read about them, listen to videos, and I think the main thing is experiment. Just play with it. And um, not all of your watercolors are going to turn out. I think I throw away two out of three. So, and maybe one in ten, I think, wow, maybe I'll put that in a frame. And that doesn't happen real often. So, I'm going to step over here just to uh, let you, I'm going to have you come up on your own later uh, when you want to take a break from your own painting. I've written a little bit about each one of these to tell about the paper I used. Uh, the technique, and so forth. And a lot of people say, I'm afraid to do watercolor because I can't control it. Well, you can after you learn how to work with it. Uh, for instance, this is a tightly controlled painting. Uh, within some of the onions, you let the colors kind of blend on their own as you apply them. But it's pretty tight. This one is kind of wet in the background and loose, just some Indian paintbrush wildflowers. This is a combination of being real loose and then a little tighter. And on this one, I had to save a lot of the whites. And when I do my watercolors, I do what they call transparent watercolor. I don't add any uh, whitening to it, no gouache or any other medium uh, to add the white. So anything white has to be saved. And the first painting I'm going to work on, um, there are different ways to save the whites, and I'll tell you about that. <clears throat> and this painting was just kind of fun to play around with. It's on Fabriano paper, which is a really high quality but thinner paper than the arches that I normally use. And this was not frameable because there are areas of what we call mud. Too many colors coming together and getting dull and just not that spark you want in a watercolor. This I just kind of played around with, seeing what uh, colors would do together how the water would move the colors. So it was just kind of fun. Okay, I'm just going to do a simple little sailboat scene. I used what we call liquid mask or masking. I did that a couple days ago to save the uh, sails on the sailboats, and they will resist any water or color. And then later on, when the paper is totally dry, I remove it. I'm going to just show you a few of my simple uh, take with me kind of uh, pieces of equipment, whether I do plain air or if I come 
here, for instance. First of all, I have a very limited palette. I'm not going to hold it up high because I've added water to soften the pigments. But I have uh, four or five blues. Some are warm, some are cool. I have a cool yellow and a warm yellow and um, a very warm uh, red, which is a cadmium scarlet. It's a new color I have worked with before, and I'm just trying to expand a little bit and learn about different colors. And then I have an alizarin crimson, um, which is, a, as you all know, in your own paints, what it can do. Now, when you're working with watercolor, some of the colors stain terribly. You have to be careful. They'll go into the paper, and you can never get them off. And Alan, I bet you know about that. Um, they're great colors, but you have to use them very judiciously, or they can kind of wreck your painting. Uh, Alyssa and Crimson is one of those, and all of your phalos. Okay, uh, this is, these are the paints that I'm using today. I separate them out. Uh, this is called my landscape palette, and that's what I'm using here today. At home, I have a larger palette with, you know, 20, 30 colors, um, but for something like this, I'm using a limited palette. I have soap, liquid soap, if I want to use the liquid mask, I wet a paintbrush, and then I put a little bit of liquid soap, and then the, the masking, because <laughs> if you leave the masking in your brush, it's ruined. It's like an acrylic paint. If you leave it too long without washing it out, your brush is ruined. But the masking is even faster to dry. So that, that's just a good little technique. Um, salt for textural effects that you can sprinkle on wet paint, leave it, and then when it's dry, rub it off. And you get especially good for water and maybe uh, weeds in a field. Pieces of masking tape you can cut out for different shapes. Uh, you put that on your paper hang around it, when it's dry, remove the masking tape. Always have paper towels. I like to use uh, lint-free old washcloths or towels. Make sure they, they're really old and the lint is gone. Uh, just to blot up your paint, excess water and paint. Um, brushes, I usually don't use all of these. Um, I work a lot with what we call the flats, and this is a, a staple, which is a very soft uh, brush, natural fiber from the, the staple animal. I don't like to think about that, but um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I guess that's the way it goes. But a staple brush will hold a lot of pigment and water. And then I have an old Windsor Newton brush that I've had many, many years uh, with a beveled end, so you can scratch in it or help remove paint while it's still wet. I use a fan brush sometimes for foliage in the distance or trees, uh, maybe grasses. Of course, your rounds. Uh, or use whatever for skies, clouds, water, and the various sizes of them. A rigger brush looks better when it's wet. Wonderful for branches and weeds or details that you want really good lines. And then a real expensive toothbrush. And that is used to put in your paint and then spatter by going like that for something like in a field, leaves on a tree. Uh, you have to kind of be careful to block off parts of your painting where you don't want the splatters to go. 
and stiffer brushes like oil painting brushes to help remove pigment uh, that you don't want. And a drawing pencil, not too dark. I just stick with the B. Uh, if it's too dark, it can come up through your paint. And I think that's about, oh, these are kind of good little, I get a lot from the dentist to help me on my equipment. And this is just a little syringe, and you can put paint in it or the liquid masking and apply it to your paper um, for different effects. And this little holder came from the dentist. <laughs> you need to get to know your hygienist really well, and she'll help you out. Um, and a little spray bottle. And that's about it for equipment uh, that I have to have. Uh, maybe in addition, a good art stretchy gum eraser. Don't use any other kind of eraser on your watercolor paper or it will damage the paper. And when that happens, the paint settles in and it gets all scrubby looking. So I'm trying to make this free because you're here to paint. And I'm going to just paint while you paint. And if you want to come up now and again to see what's going on, feel free to do that. Uh, oh, I do want to mention clean water. I have one tub where I rinse out a brush before I get another color from the palette. And then if I want to add water to that paint, I save that for really clean water. And you'll see I make a lot of trips to the sink to get rid of the dirty water. Uh, dirty water can ruin your painting. You want it to be fresh and clean and sparkly. Uh, and you're, I won't get into composition and elements of design and principles and all of that. You know that. But a good painting has to incorporate not only technique, but your knowledge of your composition and elements of design and values and all of that. So. Any quick questions before we all start? Any? Okay, I'm going to start first with a little, just a simple sailboat scene, and then I have time I'm going to work on a uh, landscape of a farm in the snow uh, to celebrate our day today. Hi, Sally. Oh, how are you? Fine, how are you? Any questions? Lizard and Chris used to turn dark over time. Is it? That's a good question. I don't know that. What's the question? Good. It would turn. A lizard and crimson used to turn dark over time and actually turn almost black. It's a great color if you want. A, I do not use white and I do not use black in my paintings. So if you want a dark, dark value, use a lizard. Crimson mixed with a phthalo green, and you will have a really dark cavity. Is that right, Sally? I'm sorry, I wasn't even listening. <laughs> <laughs> For a dark, dark watercolor cavity, glycerin crimson and phthalo green. Yeah, that does really well. You can do any combination of the three main colors because you can have a red black or a blue black or a pink black. Um, Sally is an expert. She's going down to the watercolor society. That's, that's for watercolor pigment or? I think any across the board, but especially watercolor because yeah. we can't use, well, we can, but I'm not going to use black. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Because it's very dull. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth and Crimson is subject to oxidation in the tube, or out, and that's why it turns dark. All right, we need a chemist here. 